Okay. Yeah. And then um, we'll discuss afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so a brief intro that I will read. I'm sorry. It's just uh, to keep the time and the structure. Um, so what VHV, uh, as we read it um, in uh, Croatian pronunciation and a bit of defiance to hegemony of English language, stands for what, how, and for whom, which are the three basic questions of every economic organization. These questions, which were the title of our first project dedicated to the 152nd anniversary of Communist Manifesto in 2000, became the motto of our work, and we took it as a title of our collective. And you can see the, um, the cover of the book that was published on that occasion. This exhibition already established a model of our curatorial work, collective way of working, close partnership of different organizations, establishing links between different generations of artists, and trying to embed our projects in the local context, also when we realize them outside of Croatia. In a way, the Croatian context is always at the background of our projects, and its specificity is taken as a kind of symptom detectable everywhere. In briefest, this context is characterized by conditions of post-socialist transition, with its typical manifestation of excessive nationalism and criminalized privatization of public resources, as well as by post-war normalization that followed the wars in ex-Yugoslavia at the beginning of the 1990s. Normalization that primarily suppressed talk of ethnic cleansing and the major theft of public wealth by the new elites. In our exhibitions, we are often making references and dedications. As in the case of our first exhibition, What, How, and For Whom, uh, when Manifesto was not the subject of the exhibition, but a trigger to initiate a public debate on the issues of recent history, the same was with Istanbul Biennial, which was titled What Keeps Mankind Alive? After the song from the Free Pen uh, Penny Opera written by Bertolt Brecht in 1928. The biennial did not directly thematize Brecht's method, but linked us back to the economic concerns of what, how, and for whom, pertinent in 2008 and 9 when we were working on the exhibition. First and foremost, the concept of the exhibition manifested itself as a surplus of propaganda, direct interpretative <coughs> manipulation that presents the work in a resoundingly political key. Though it showed many different things, the exhibition explicitly stated what it desired to show, that a just world order and distribution of economic goods and services is viable and absolutely vital, and that communism is still the only name for that desirable project. On the whole, what keeps... So some of the posters of the exhibition that were produced, and them on the street. On the whole, What Keeps Mankind Alive took on the role of being pedagog pedagogical and illustrative, leaving individual works to negotiate a finer balance between critical intervention and formal aesthetic concerns. That does not mean that the exhibition wanted to draw up some sort of moral check checklist of all the wrongdoings that plague the world. It rather took an active and agitational position, revealing in the process its own complicity in the situation it seeked to critique and change. We wanted to stress the fact that the curatorial view is not objective in the sense of some alleged impartiality, whereby, whereby equal distancing would enable a, an accurate point of view. Exactly the contrary, objective point of view is one that emphasizes its position and the ways of its own involvement. Of course, Istanbul Biennial has all the institutional and structural features uh, a biennial exhibition format ha uh, has. Element of cultural tourism through which cities attempt to position themselves on the map of globalized world. Manifestations tending to cultural shopping in which art is often presented as cool cool, fun, entertaining, market-driven event designed to assure a more seamless integration of art and capital. So this is the entrance to the main venue, Entrepot, which was a former uh, customs warehouse. And on the white uh, wall behind the WAN, you can see the numerous sponsors listed. And this is us, sorry, at the opening. 
Curators, Biennial uh, Director, Director of the Istanbul Foundation for the Culture and the, the Arts, who is the organizer of the Biennial as well as many uh, other events, Representative of Istanbul Capital of Europe 2010, and Representative of Koç, one of the biggest Turkish corporations and also main biennial sponsor. This conflation of powers provoked just criticism in itself, but combined with the leftist rhetorics of the exhibition, apparently even more so. Especially when the posters that I showed appeared few weeks before the exhibition, reactions became more and more vehement. So, one of the protest materials before the exhibition opened, sticker that was um, distributed throughout the city, Begenal actually means uh, selling out, so it's a play of word with biennial. Chok, it's too much, and it's turned around Koch, which is the main sponsor. And the moustache on Stalin, it's an upside down turned uh, logo of um, Koch Foundation. These are the... Um, the protest culminated in demonstrations at the opening of the biennial, which you can see here, initiated by the initiative Resist Istanbul, organized in preparation for the protest against IMF meeting that happened in Istanbul that uh, same October. In days before the biennial opening, in the open letters circulated locally, but also among the artists uh, of biennial, uh, the demand of protesters was, was articulated as a call to artists to leave the biennial and do art on the streets as the only place where politics takes place. But in the context of biennial opening, these protests merged with a, a social spectacle and machinery that lies behind such highly representational uh, manifestation and all too easily slipped into performative framework of the opening ceremony. Many people actually thought it was part of the opening ceremony which was directed by Croatian theater director Oliver Ferlic, with whom we collaborated throughout the process. Uh, we already for the first biennial press conference, a year before the, the, the biennial, in November 2008, instead of releasing the concept of the, uh, in the conventional press conference format, we performed our concept on the stage of the SES Theater in Istanbul, as directed by uh, Oliver Ferlic, as whom I mentioned. We tried to express the truth of our situation, as Brecht would call it, but ma by making the curatorial promise that never fails uh, to fail visibly, by performing our decision and contesting the relationship between the curator, artist, and the audience, as well as the structure of the biennial exhibition. The appearance of four reciting curators on stage questioned and mocked the need for glamour in an art event and the stereotypes about power position of a curator, in this case, all-female collective. Further contestation of the social relationships uh, that the biennial creates happened during the opening ceremony, at the opening uh, with, on which city mayor and minister of culture were present, when we were replaced on stage by four Turkish actresses who delivered our opening text in fluent Turkish. To go back to the protest, to understand them, uh, we have to go uh, to talk a bit about cultural and political polarization in Turkey at those particular times. Brecht, as a starting point to think about the role of artistic endeavor in conditions of contemporary ca capitalism, for us never meant to take him as a classic that needs to be rediscovered and shown to new generation, not as a Che Guevara of the academic left, but as a starting point to create a certain political aesthetic puzzle that could stimulate and properly formulate the pr problems of the present. But in the, but in the local Turkish context at the time, Brecht was a specially contested figure. And as this was time when, in the words of writer and critic Suri Suraya Evren, the conflict between an orthodox left position and contemporary art played a critical role in understanding of contemporary art. This conflict was a consequence of the move of the portion of the left towards nationalism, move more and more apparent in the wake of September 11th, which resulted in an animosity to contemporary art, portrayed as ultimate example of decadence, agent of manipulated cosmopolitanism that sought to corrode national identity, constructed as ideological might of Kemalism. 
At that time, there, uh, there were emerging outlines of a uh, conflict within the left itself, with mutually pejorative descriptions of opposed camps as liberal left and orthodox left, in which contemporary art was defined against a text that saw it as sus uh, suspiciously suspected to recuperative mecha mechanisms of the logic of capital. Precisely in this condition, when so-called liberal left was defending the contemporary art as an ally in left political struggles, the maneuver that took Brecht, orthodox political figure, and moved it into a field of contemporary art opposed to it and associated with liberal camps, was a direct intervention in the inter in intellectual and artistic landscape of the city. Biennial induced a lot of protests. Um, its framework of pure neoliberalism and especially a uh, sponsorship of uh, Koch. And the evocation of Brecht obviously touched the core of debates that shaped the relationship between art and politics at that time. But uh, let's go to the exhibition itself. We attempted to expose and problematize the condition of presentation to peel away the usual glossy surface of the biennial itself exposing the technical, economic, and social wiring underneath that makes the event function. One large exhibition room was des uh, designed by Dejan Kršić, member of VHV, in which we displayed a series of graphs, p-charts, and statistics explaining how the biennial was financed, what the geographical range and gender of its participant consists of, how disparities in a national GDP influence the cultural politics between glo global north and south, east and west, etc. These uh, statistics were also included in both uh, biennial publications. This information that usually stays invisible are telling signs of situation in which cultural workers were, are operating then and nowadays, even at the supposedly prime events like biennial. Like, for example, the fact that out of the budget of the biennial, which just before the opening was estimated at some 2 million euros, only 14% are artist-related costs, while operational and promotional costs amount to 27%, and 49 are exhibition-related costs, so let's say venue of the rental space and similar, or that artists receive no fee or that curatorial fee is 1.95% of the budget, or that more than a quart, quarter of the budget was provided by international public funding bodies. This was per perhaps the most explicitly Brechtian move, in which we tried to show our own position, which sliced open the biennial as eminent neoliberal machinery by making its economic reality visible. But this move was not about the transparency. It rather opened the key to what stayed hidden, Many things were not possible to disclose. For example, the amount of um, each individual sponsorship, including Koch, was not disclosed, as the biennial contracts with their sponsors explicitly uh, forbid the disclosure of this information. So how did the exhibition look in the end? What did we do with two uh, million euro? It is, of course, very hard to present all its complexities, where for us uh, every detail was very important, from the go left signs that were scattered throughout, on the floor throughout the venues, to the Ataturk paraphernalia that was still kept uh, in the Greek school that we used at one of the venues, to the sentence that one could compose to the opening uh, works that were in the main venue, Antrepo, who sang King Don't Complain, and Sanya Ivekovic Waiting for a Revolution. The exhibition took place at three locations. We wanted the public institutional space to give it support in the context of apparent lack of public resources uh, in Turkey. In the end, the biennial took place in three venues. This is, unfortunately, you can't see it that well. This is also one of the statistics that was uh, shown in the, in the exhibition and published in the publications about all the spaces that we wanted to use but uh, couldn't. Um, so the biennial took place in three venues. An abandoned Greek school shut down in 2003 for lack of the pupils. 
the Waterfront Customs Depot entrepot. This is the glitch, yes. famous glitch, okay. So this is entrepot. Um, this was the, the Greek school, one of the classrooms in the Greek school where we showed some of the um, photos of the, that, was, that were found actually in the school. So in each of the venues, actually, there was one space that was considered to be a classroom. And that was uh, more for the reflection and discussion of the exhibition itself. Then Antrepo and, and the former tobacco warehouse Tutun de Pozu, which is this one. Antrepo and uh, tobacco warehouse are sites where, that were formerly fueling the primary city economy. Nowadays turn into exhibition spaces, and they were used at previous editions of Istanbul Biennials, while the Greek school, educational institution with its socio-political context that ref refers to the pr problematic status of minorities in Turkey, was used for the first time. We used given parameters of the biennial format to work around the potential of the mainstream cultural institution, which resulted in an almost conventional, museum-like format of the white cube disposition that invests in the exhibition as keeper of memory and as a public space, open to political deb debates and expressions of social antagonisms. I will not go into details of exhibition, uh, just a few points around which the exhibition was uh, organized. We tried to break away from the predictability of biennialism reporting on contemporary art, that biennials are supposed to provide an overview of new and recent production, and maintain the tension between past and present. We attempted to create a kind of relational geography between different times and historical circumstances while stressing the present moment that we experience history in. We loosely organized the exhibition uh, set up around the questions of transformation of work conditions and relation of domination. So this is the work by Aydan Murtazaoglu and Bulent Shanger that employed recent university graduates as assistant within the installation. The work by Maria Rui that talked about the precarization and outsourcing of textile workers in um, Spain. The work by Cape uh, Bremer. Um, the work by uh, Tamas Sentiobi, which dealt with the questions of uh, precarizations of uh, workers and worker conditions already in socialism. And it was, in fact, uh, banned immediately after it was made in the 60s in Hungary. And we showed it for the first time. It's restored copies. Then the, the second important uh, thread was feminist issues and normative gender roles, like in works by Sanya Ivekovic, Nil Bargiras, from Turkey, Kwikulik from Poland, Janan Schenol, Michelle Journiak from uh, France, Margaret Harrison from UK, and many other artists. I'm sorry I'm going through images quite fast. I'm trying to give an impression of the scope of the exhibition, but maybe we can talk about some works a bit later. Then an uh, important thematic thread was the ideology of normality and everyday organization, crisis of public space and exclusion. This is Wafa Hurani, worked called Kalandia uh, 2047. Kalandia is um, the biggest checkpoint between Israel and Palestine territories, and 47, obviously, 2047, 100 years after the important uh, date for the Israel and Palestine. Um, then decolonizing architecture, then a strand of work dealing with limits of democracy, etc., from Argentina, and Artur Zmijewski from Poland, or Nam Chung Pike with a very untypical work, intervention on the um, uh, covers of Life magazines. Relationship uh, between uh, guilt uh, and forgiveness in the aftermath of conflict work by uh, Rabia Amroe and Marco Pelhan, the work that dealt with um, atrocities committed in Srebrenica under the UN watch. And the work by uh, Vandelin von Oldenboro about, uh, or the questions of food. This is work by uh, Hans-Peter Feldman. 
Very important thread that ran through the whole exhibition argued against dominant views of so on socialist history, which equaled the fall of communism as final proof of the victory of democracy over its totalitarian enemies, such as the installation by Stodelat from Russia, David Malkovic from Croatia, or the Museum of American Art, Istanbul, that is dealing with the traveling exhibitions of American modern art in the aftermath of the Second World War. Also very important was a figure of dissident artist that, was, uh, that is usually interpreted as uh, unilaterally rebellious to the official ideology. Uh, while we uh, looked at it as a rebellion against the unrealized potential and bureaucratization of the revolutionary project. And um, this is, um, for uh, example, work by Vyacheslav Akunov from a peripheral position in Tashkent, who reverted the experiences of Moscow and conceptualism from the 1970s and the pioneering happenings and actions of 1980s, and produced a series of diverse works, collages, prints, installations that are pushing the aesthetics of Soviet political propaganda beyond its overviews of signs and raise a number of questions that we tried to show not as strictly ironic subversion of the ideological apparatus, but as specters of communism haunting the exhibition. And the works by Vyacheslav Akunov were actually exhibited in uh, all three venues. As a whole, the exhibition has been devised as a didactic tool to, promont, uh, to prompt our facilities for, for what Brian Holmes and Claire Pentecost called the politics of perception in their uh, text written for the exhibition reader. As an illustration of the principles of politics of perception as governing principle of the exhibition, I'd like to mention a few more works for the end. This is work by Trevor Paglen, Celestial Objects, Istanbul from 2009, is a series of photographs with feel, uh, fields of stars on closer lo look interrupted by streaks of light, in which what appear as sensuous and pure astronomic pictures reveals the military and reconnaissance intelligence satellites in the night skies over Istanbul. Or the work Shadow Report that you actually see here on the floor, and here on the floor as well, and it could be seen on the floor throughout all the venues. This is work by Sonia Ivekovic that consisted of crumbled sheets of red paper scattered throughout all, uh, all the biennial venues. On these were, in four different sheets of paper, the main points of report compiled by Turkish NGOs and submitted to UN bodies on the status of women and gender inequality in Turkey, including the most alarming sub subject of honor killing. The artist treat, treated the, the printed sheets like rubbish, as it softened the fate of such reports in powerful organizations. At the same time, the report has been turned into a campaign leaflet, and each of the visitors to the exhibition had a choice of picking it up, assembling, and reading the full document, or just passing by it, ignoring it. Or the last work that I'm going to show, by Mladen Stilinovic, um, nobody wants to see from 2009 that was based on the fact that only three richest men in the world own as much as 600 millions of the poor people and was the visual re realization of that fact. So you have one number three on one sheet of paper and then as many number threes printed on sheets of paper as needed to represent 600 million of the poorest people. In 2009, we felt that people still needed to be convinced of that. But of course, now that Occupy Movement managed to legitimize capitalism and establish Fermi 99 against 1%, the terrain cl cl clearly shifted. And with this, the relation of art and political engagement and alliances. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Well, thank you, Yvette, and uh, thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. I was actually going to start by saying that um, we're very excited to be in this different space tonight because we were hoping that it would be a kind of more intimate affair, but here we are sitting on the platform uh, at a bit of a distance, so I, I don't think that point really uh, is going to work. Um, but um, I'm going to start with... Um, well, we're going to start discussing 
um, the Istanbul Biennial in a bit more detail, um, touching on some of the, of the many things that you've just um, talked about. And then we're going to um, bring in an, um, the most recent exhibition you've done called uh, Really Useful Knowledge, which closed uh, earlier this month at the Reina Sofia Museum in Madrid. And um, what we're bringing this in to kind of discuss both how it, how it follows on from the experience of, of curating the biennial and how it has a lot of um, continuities with that mm -hmm. exhibition, both mm -hmm. in terms of the to topic, the topic is education and, mm -hmm. um, um, and some of the artists shown. But I think also, or I, I thought I sensed a kind of a, a bit of a change in, in attitude and kind of the curatorial attitude, but we can discuss that uh, when we come to it. Um, and then I thought I should also start by saying that I'm one of these people that haven't seen either of these two exhibitions that we're discussing, so I'm kind of coming from the uh, angle of having read about it and looked online, videos and images on what I could find. Mm. All right. So, so yeah, so the, the first question I was going to ask is, um, at that time when you were invited to curate the Istanbul Biennial, you were described as an emerging and radical uh, curatorial collective, or, although, of course, you had done numerous exhibitions already. And um, since you started your working together in mm -hmm. 1999, uh, and you had had the curatorial direction of the gallery um, Nova in Zagreb since 2003. But perhaps we can start talking about what it meant to you to mm -hmm. take on a biennial at that point. I mean, we've seen some before. Uh, several of them, uh, and the, for example, the biennial done by Charles Session Vasip Kotun was, um, and still is, is one of my favorite exhibitions. Um, the one done by uh, Hujanru was pretty impressive as well, in terms of how it engaged with the city and space. So yes, we were quite flattered and uh, happy to be invited. Mm. Also, you get invited in a very Nice way, I have to say. You don't have to apply. Mm. There is a uh, there is a board uh, consisting of uh, international curators, previous biennial curators. They discuss, they select somebody, and then you receive a phone call saying, "Would you like to curate a biennial?" Which is mm. nice, I have to say. And uh, in terms of the experience, it was challenging. One could say. <laughs> It, the, um, it was a, a tremendous learning experience. Mm. Uh, you learn when you get invited to, to, to do an event like this, how people are open and willing to help, how many opportunities to new research, to knowledge, to, to, uh, to travel, to meeting artists actually open. So it was a, a tremendously um, uh, fulfilling learning process. Mm. It was also quite exhausting in a way because at the time when we were doing it, and this, um, although it says that Biennial had two million euro budget, and I mentioned, Biennial was quite heavily underfunded. Mm. And at one fairly early on, we decided we would very much like to try to do research in the areas around Istanbul, to take Istanbul as a center of a, of a certain region, to travel to Central Asia, to Middle East, to Eastern Europe. And this was very, very hard to, to make happen. So we had to fundraise along the way for mm -hmm. our travels, which on the other hand, as I said, once, once you become um, a curator of such a visible event, Opportunities do open up, yeah. and um, it was, yeah. and the, yeah, and then another kind of opening angle I thought was um, the year two thousand seven, two thousand eight was when the financial crisis hit, and um, I heard someone recently describe that moment as a time when people thought of the crisis as as kind of subject or a topic to pick up and and work with or, or react to, and then. Yeah, I remember anyway. when, when, when we announced actually the, 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 the crisis unfolded as we announced the concept, really. In, because I remember when we were uh, writing it and discussing it and talking about it also with the 
colleagues and friends about what would be the pertinent topic, it was the crisis was in the air, but it didn't really hit. It really mm. hit uh, that fall in these couple of months as we were announcing it, so in the fall of 2008, yeah. and then it gained momentum as we were actually really preparing the, the exhibition. And in that respect, we did feel like, yes, we kind of really hit the, the, the raw nerve, you could say, mm. of what was the uh, important topic to, to discuss at, at, that, that at that moment. Okay. And, and so, so the, um, the choice of Brecht as a kind of, you call it a red thread of influence, um, and of course the concern with the basic values of, of the communist project um, links to your earlier project, as you also mentioned yourself, your first exhibition titled What, How and For Whom? Um, intended for the 152nd anniversary of the Communist Manifesto. And, and I was kind of just curious because I looked, you sent me mm -hmm. the catalogue of that first exhibition and um, the opening page, I think it's, is this the cover? And, well, oh, the, the cover was oh, the, the cover first was one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So these are the opening pages. Yeah. And uh, the question, what keeps mankind alive is kind of in this um, catalogue and followed by the, the lyrics of the mm -hmm. song. Mm -hmm. um, and then nine years later, again, you kind of pick up the same we Some. often we so, yeah we so often do that. I think uh, uh, there is there are topics such as the question of the, the the legacy of the socialist project in the in the former Yugoslavia, the question of the national conflict, the question of the transition of the uh, the, the of the so-called transition, whatever mm. it means, because it was the word with which we were bombarded, the question of interwining of politics and economy and the way how the conflict that was presented as national conflict was actually the, the, the consequence of the, the manipulations of the political economy and the fall down of the socialist project in the 80s are kind of our, you could say, obsessive topics a bit to, the, to, to a certain extent that the mm. critic in like 2006 told us, which was already like six, seven years that we were working together, told us at one point that we are always doing the same exhibition. Mm. So in this respect, yes, we are always coming back to, to, the, to the issues that we opened through our previous projects. Mm. Because I don't think that actually they are closed and we're trying to provide a different reading. And Brecht, why Brecht? Uh, I, as I mentioned to you before, we are, we are all like, we all studied art history and literature. Obviously, we, we liked him a lot, and at one point, and we often come from the important figures and or from the important texts that we read, and we felt that for the biennial, for this type of the exhibition, his right, his. Um, Place, mm -hmm. also the three penny novel, but also his writing on aesthetics open up uh, many of the burning issues that are that were also the way how he writes about the contradiction, about the dialectics, about not giving up in the face of the difficult circumstances, because we also had our doubts about the biennial as such. Mm -hmm. I mean, as I said yeah. before, we were flattered, but all the criticism against the biennial cannot be dismissed. Uh, so just yeah. out of but hand. So in this respect, I think Brecht was, uh, when we were thinking where to start from constructing the exhibition at one point, uh, his writing came as a, mm. as a good uh, focal point. Mm. And, and just to go back to what you're talking about, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the biennial and uh, being kind of taking on the biennial, being implicated in the biennial and, um, I was going to say that one of the reasons this exhibition is so important, I think, is because it's trying to do something with the biennial format, framework of the international biennial. You chose, instead of choosing um, artists from um, countries that have great uh, funding structures mm. and uh, with, with lots of visibilities for artists, you, you kind of looked, as you said, at um, Istanbul as a center, and then the Middle East and Eastern Europe. And um This was particularly important for us because we felt, I mean, also from a very kind of a selfish reason, but also because we felt it's really important to try to establish links uh, between uh, the, um, these regions that would not be mediated through the Western institution or I, mm. which is the only way that we could see 
art from Middle East, for me, coming from Eastern Europe, was to travel to London, for example, to such a gallery. At that point, actually, there was a big uh, Middle, uh, Middle Eastern mm -hmm. Saatchi exhibition uh, when I was here in London. So this was really important uh, for us to try to... Also, we thought these were the geographies that we were interested in. I know it sounds uh, a bit um, uh, simple, but as I said, one of our obsessions is uh, the way how conflict plays out in the times of the economical strife and what are the interrelationships between the, the, the conflict and the economic uh, manipulation and uh, the, what is the relationship between the, the political economy and nationalism. And we felt that if we can in a way, see what are the parallels, what are the same kind of struggles, same battles that are lost or won, mm. same ambivalent relationship towards the contemporary and conceptual art as um, for an import that we could hear in Turkey and we could hear in Croatia, like, you know, all oh, the artists that are successful in the West are only the ones that are pandering to the Western taste. Uh, so many yeah. of the topics that are actually opening in these countries were interested for us. Mm. And yes, as, as you said, uh, it would have been easier to just accept the, the, the invitations of the, 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 the art councils of the rich countries to go and do research there. But then we decided uh, to make an mm. extra effort to, to mm. travel mm. To, to these places. Um, so. Yeah. And, um, and in, in, in this, well, not in, in mm -hmm. relation to this specifically, but as an overall project, it was in terms of its uh, ambition and the ambitions mm -hmm. you put forward in your curatorial um, text, you were kind of making a... Um, just find my it was a bit yeah. cheeky, no. Yeah. Yeah. The whole, I mean, this is also why what keeps mankind alive. It also had a bit of an ironic play with all the big uh, titles. You know, when you come mm. to the biennial exhibitions, either to Venice or here or there, there are always these, what the, the world, there is, a, there are big, big words, a lot of quite, in a way, a bit pretentious titles. Mm. So this one is also, when you look at it, and if, if you were to take it out of the, 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 the Brecht context, also you can read it a bit from this yeah. perspective. So it had a bit of a playing with itself also. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the, but mm -hmm. the thing that you were kind of, you but you're also launching this massive, I mean, y you might think of it as a p play as well, but it was mm -hmm. also a very mm -hmm. serious critique of a kind of, hegemony of Western capitalism yes, in, in for sure. all, all mm -hmm. the political statements and then also a kind of critique of the biennial uh, framework as I saw it as being implicated in these kind of in the the neoliberal logic of of a uh, free market and the, the city kind of having to promote itself as a cultural destination um, yes, you could say, I mean, critique or at least, I mean, an attempt to, to be aware of it and to mm. try to, to see if there are ways to work around it mm. and how, how could you do it and what, what are the possible ways. Obviously, through the, the selections of work that are critical in this particular moment and that are giving some kind of um, proposals and new reworkings of the, the, the communist or socialist project or looking back to it without necessarily being nostalgic. Mm. So yeah. for different types of work, there was a critique, of course, of the, of the, the framework of the, the biennial as well. Yeah. I, think, I, I mean, mean, and this was also done, I think, maybe for our performance and the way how, because when we discussed how to announce the concept, we also discussed the way in which we are perceived and how can you do an exhibition that is dealing with Brecht and then just announce it in the most expensive uh, Istanbul hotel, which is how it's usually done. And this is, and then we started talking with a, with a theater director and actually the, the performance became one of his artworks as well. So as many other things, I think many things of what we did came from the discussions with colleagues, uh, curator friends, theoreticians from Istanbul, um, artists who mm. are preparing works. Mm. But, but but that so that conf that conference, mm -hmm. we saw that picture of the four of you 
standing in a theater. That's the four of you. Right? Yes. Yeah. So you're you're not. And then in the opening for the um, biennial, you have actors. Yes. In the press conference in uh, for the announcing the mm. concept a year before, there was a different text, and we published the newspapers with a curatorial concept, and we actually dramatized it and um, really performed it. So it wasn't. It we learned it. We yeah. uh, practiced. We started with a bit of dancing, and then we climbed on the chairs and uh, performed the concept. Okay. Recited it, yeah. you could say. In yeah. And this you saw as a as a kind of Brechtian yes. performance yes. of the curator's yes. okay. role, and also of what is expected of us as women, how to, how we are supposed to look, what are we supposed to do, in which way we are supposed to perform. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, again, in discussion with Oliver Ferlich, we decided to actually replace ourselves with the actresses on the, on the performance, mm -hmm. on the opening night. Mm -hmm. One thing that actually we had to give up was putting the whole opening performance and the whole dignitaries and everybody, all the audience behind the fence in the... Yeah, right. there, there was a proposal actually okay. for the opening night that by the director that he would put all the audience and the, the actresses uh, performing the concept divided by fans, but okay. then that didn't work. work. Okay, but um, yeah, so maybe just to come back to um, to what happened, the, the, the thing I could say the narrative mm -hmm. was that you entered this dominant uh, institution, the biennial, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. you put forward your very um, proactive political um, program, mm -hmm. a kind of call for action. There's this, um, I can quote the, the curatorial text where you kind mm -hmm. of have this, you're asking yourself, is there a way we can kind of uh, boost the, the audience capacity for action mm -hmm. through the mm -hmm. exhibition mm -hmm. and, and through everything that it encompasses, mm -hmm. I guess, mm -hmm. all the, everything to posters to mm -hmm. opening. Mm -hmm. and um, So you enter this dominant uh, institution and then the main critique you receive is one of being complicit with that uh, institution uh, instead of being met, met by alliances of people and group from outside wanting to join you. I mean, this is a, this is a very grand narrative, but this mm -hmm. is uh, coming from what you were saying about... Um, there were alliances and people coming to join okay. us, but uh, <laughs> the, the, the most visible, actually, reaction was the, the protests. Okay. For sure. From uh, if we are talking uh, about the local activist political community in Istanbul, so there were quite uh, positive reactions from the artist community, mm -hmm. from the international community. We got very good reactions mm -hmm. in most cases. Maybe people who didn't like it don't tell it. But um, in terms of um, the, the the activist community in Istanbul. Uh, mostly we received, there, there was a, a, a number of people that, were, uh, that uh, defended us and there mm. was even a fight on the left again, around the exhibition. Yeah. But I would say the, um, the people who were against it were, were louder. This, this was louder. Mm. And what I find very unfortunate is that most of the criticism actually um, began and finished with Koch sponsorship. They are one of the biggest com companies in Turkey. They are clearly the bad guys. They made their, they own everything from production of vehicles to supermarket chains and mm. like really like every, in all different fields, from tourism, hotels, different, different field, fields of industries. They made money during the Second World War on the production of arms. So, I mean, but the criticism that was, was it was kind of an impasse or hitting a dead wall because mm -hmm. from this uh, uh, camp, criticism yeah. was like, Whatever you do, you can't do it. Just leave the biennial. Yeah, Whatever so you do within this framework, it's doomed. Yeah. It's reappropriated immediately. So for us, there was no, I mean, there's basically no way that you can engage. At yeah. least I felt, because we did try and we tried 
at one point to also to go to some activist meetings, to some we were received, to some we were not even allowed, as long as we do biennial. So, you know, yeah, so at fine. one point you just, the, the, the criticism was as long as you do, the, the biennial is completely appropriated by the capital and there's nothing you can do within it. Mm. And um, I felt that this was not, um, not a constructive uh, way that you can actually. Yeah, so they sent a letter, for example. Yeah. Was it the day before the opening? Uh, the letter day? came a couple of days before the opening, and it invited the uh, artists from the biennial and us to leave the biennial as such and mm. come and produce art on the streets. None of the artists left the biennial. Mm. And w we discussed it, I mean, uh, right before. I mean, the question is, and it is a question of a curatorial authority and how do you deal with it and do artists leave such a prestigious exhibition mm. ever? What would be the, I mean, it would be maybe curious to talk with some artists. At one point they would leave such a prestigious uh, exhibition. Mm. What would be there? And, yeah. But I mean, I have to say this is also six, seven years ago. There have been several calls for boycott and uh, discussions of whether you stay within an exhibition or not and how do you deal with contested funding. I have to say, in general, I'm not for the boycott. We always um, s uh, quote Mladen Stilinovic and one of his saying that he actually said that during one of the, the discussions like this when he said, all the money is dirty and all the money is ours. I think also coming from the, the country with a really strong tradition of the state funding, I think we have different state funding and also we had no problem in taking money from the right-wing government, from the Ministry of Culture. So for us, I think this question of whose money is was mm. maybe we're more relaxed about it than many people in Turkey who just dismiss it. Yeah. And uh, as you said in your presentation, there was no way, uh, one of the things you couldn't visualize in your um, mm -hmm. statistics about mm -hmm. the budget of the exhibition was how much, how much, gives, how yeah. much God gives. So we know that there was 25% of the whole of the budget was a private sponsorship. Exactly. Um, but within that, Exactly, no. Yeah. But you can't really do it uh, neither for public sponsorships mm. always either. I'm not sure how much the, the sponsors like, um, I don't know. Uh, different arts councils or different art foundation mm. always like to, to you to mention exactly which amount of the money mm. they have given. At least, um, I mean, that really depends from the funding body to funding body. But I want and uh, I have to say, in terms of the um, mm, uh, content. Koch did not come to a single meeting, didn't have any complaints about, or any comments <coughs> about the exhibition as such mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they felt like standing on the stage with us being attacked. I don't think that they thought this is the best use of their money, <laughs> I have to say, but they didn't, um, no. they didn't complain, they didn't have anything to say. In that respect, well, I think the, the people at the Biennial or the, the, the Cultural Foundation did a good job to make this line clear. One thing I have to say that the Biennial said absolutely no, they don't want to do it, and this is a question of self-censorship, I think. Mm. They wouldn't let us put the, the sticker in the, in the reader. You know, the, the, the little what? Stalin with the, uh. the... Because that, because of course the book was printed at the last moment, it was like going to print like five days before the exhibition. And when it, it got out, we, we were like, oh, we're putting this in the book. And then the people from Biennial were like, no way, <laughs> absolutely not. And then it was... Because you wanted to incorporate that Yes, reaction. I mean, why yeah. not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, no. Did you have any other kind of... Um, were you met by other objections from the from the biennial? It was and that, and it was the, this fence between the the, the opening oh, yes. ceremony and the minister of culture, but <laughs> mostly no, no. Mm. 
I mean, not mostly, but actually these are the only two things. There were no questions about the works. There, there were a couple of the works uh, from Turkish artists that I would say were very problematic, I mean problematic, um, quite um, brave in terms of the um, um, at, talking about Atatürk, uh, Turkish military, some mm. very problematic questions in the Turkish society, and we had no problem about mm. it. Okay. I mean, yeah. no, I'm, no. And maybe we should just uh, talk a little bit about the exhibition space. Mm -hmm. So, although mm -hmm. you've mm -hmm. done mm -hmm. already quite a, a great mm -hmm. job, um, one of the one of the things that were up for discussion or discussed afterwards, and maybe maybe you mm -hmm. mentioned it mm -hmm. already, was um, y your decision to kind of go with a, a traditional. Mm -hmm. White cube mm -hmm. space, mm -hmm. and in a way, I kind of, I kind of read it as uh, you kind of taking a known framework and making deconstructions within it in the way that you put mm -hmm. these, um, the stickers on the floor and the classrooms and, um, yeah, I don't know mm -hmm. other mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. mm -hmm. kind of moments, but um, but maybe you should uh, also answer the question: Why did you not challenge this aspect of? The um, I think the. We were also discussing, talking about it, and first of all, we decided we want to do the exhibition. We like exhibitions, and we believe the ex in the exhibitions, and we think exhibitions still have something to offer as a format. Um, and so the exhibition, it was. And this was one of the things you were also asking me, the people from the Foundation of the Arts. I mean, they were clearly open to, for us doing whatever. They were happy when they heard we will do the exhibition, I have to say. They were like, <laughs> OK, good. So uh, it's not going to be the school or the discussion or completely the constructed format. It's mm -hmm. going to be the, the yeah, exhibition. Yes. And then we discussed um, many different things on how to activate it, what, what, what would we like to try to do different things. And in the end, these were the things that we felt comfortable with, with in terms of um, having um, um, equal degree of the, the um, uh, some kind of a questioning of the format or questioning of the what we are trying to do and uh, also being enough open and not in terms of not being choreographed mm. and we also decided to let the artist decide what would be the best way to present their works mm -hmm. Of course, then we created the, the narration of the exhibition through, you know, deciding which work goes, how the works go in the succession. Yeah. Yeah. But in terms, and this is also not the only question for this biennial, this is the question uh, for, I think, for um, many of our, most of our exhibitions. We, on the setup, we always work with the artists, of course, and figure out how to present their works in, in, the, in communication mm. with them. So did the the narrative of the exhibition did it follow those themes that you mentioned? No, it, actually uh, we up? no. It was oh. we were trying to actually in general I believe when there is too much of the works dealing with a similar theme close together, which is what people sometimes do, I almost never have seen it work. Mm. Somehow usually the work tend to kind of bit cancel each other mm -hmm. if they're too the, close. If they're too close, okay. and especially if there's like one too many mm. of them. So no, I mean we tried actually to construct the exhibition so that the rhythm flows in terms of the the different formats, different durations, different that the topics actually reoccur throughout mm. the the exhibition. So it wasn't like there was a food section and then there was a war section. Okay, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, so maybe just to, to round this off a little bit mm -hmm. and to kind of then think about um, really useful knowledge afterwards. Um, for the opening of the exhibition Dear Art at Calvert uh, 2022, mm -hmm. 20, mm -hmm. which was in 2013 here in London, um, you mentioned we have here, you all mm -hmm. four of you were there. Um, how the Istanbul Biennium marked a culmination of um, kind of 10 year effort on your side mm -hmm. uh, and also a kind of end to a certain way of thinking about mm -hmm. art and the potential of art. Can you maybe talk a little bit uh, about, about I think, um, what that was? Yes, uh, there was a certain um, 
maybe also the optimism or even or the feeling that things really can be changed within the institution from which we started. I think we did get a bit disillusioned as much as we really liked the exhibition and mm. I think it was a it was a good exhibition, but it was also quite traumatic process for us in terms of the 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 combination of um, pretty heavy negotiations with the foundations uh, in the last weeks, which mostly had to do with practicalities and funding, but mm -hmm. th that were like quite uh, intensive, mm -hmm. and the, the the protests with which we didn't take lightly, which we felt that, as I said, that we reached a certain impasse there or hit the that that wall. Um, as much as we think that the exhibition opened um, many different questions, we also felt it came to, like, pushed the institution to a certain point from which then the institution said, you know, like a, a bit of like a rubber band mm. that went back. Like, yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, yeah. <laughs> then... In really useful knowledge, I think it was quite different because the institution was very, very open. I would, mm. I mean, it's uh, uh, according to to our opinion one of the best European institutions that is very much in, engaged with the city, with its uh, intellectual uh, framework, that is creating really interest, interesting and meaningful program. And so in this respect, I mm. think it wasn't about pushing the institution. Yeah. It was more about, OK, and why did they invite us? And what do we do that they don't already maybe do? Yeah. Yeah. And then it was to so, do a different type of the exhibition. So yeah, so let's talk about the title, maybe, to begin with. And should we put the images on sure. um, really useful knowledge as opposed to just knowledge? <laughs> um, so the title comes from, um, it's actually workers' organizations here in the UK. Yes, yes, exactly. And I don't know, I don't have a quote or I can say exactly where the source comes. Mm. Uh, the source was actually a good friend who is a um, political scient scientist with whom we worked on several occasions in Zagreb. So she kind of uh, sent us this reference mm -hmm. as I uh, as it's written in the catalog, so not much more in, uh, information that it was a uh, really useful knowledge is a term used in for the first time in the ninth in this way in 19th century by the workers clubs to oppose what they or uh, the education they organized for themselves to the knowledge provided by the capitalists at the time which was purely technical and was meant to increase workers productivity so as opposed to chemistry and mathematics political economy, sociology, history. Mm. And um, we were invited uh, by Irena Sofia uh, Museum to do the exhibition, obviously based on, on, on Istanbul, because they saw Istanbul. And um, I mean, I have quite a, quite a few of the images. I don't know whether mm. it makes sense now to go through them. They invited us to do exhibition on anti-pedagogy. Okay. We said yes. And then we did something quite different. It was not exhibition on anti-pedagogy at all. In the widest sense, you could say it was exhibition that was maybe questioning the notion of critical pedagogy today. Mm -hmm. What we knew from the very beginning is that we want to move away from the critical pedagogy today that is seen as some kind of a self-help tool quite often. We wanted to move from um, um, aestheticizing education but we wanted to talk very much about the need for fight for public education. Mm. So this was one of the, the, the most important uh, topics. And uh, the other was the, 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 question, the tension between the, the, the arts usefulness and arts right to be useless, mm -hmm. you could say. And in this respect, maybe, um, I can just run through and show two works yeah. that are maybe good um, 
illustration you could say, although this is a really bad word. Um, of the, and these are the works by Trevor Paglen. One is by Trevor Paglen, and this is the, this um, big balloon or the model of the non-functional satellite that Trevor Paglen is preparing to uh, actually launch non-functional satellite. It's a work that is actually uh, dealing with a question of the, uh, started from the fact that um, all the people that are working in the, in the space research, or most of them, actually start from the idealism and from the, 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 the need to explore the space and to think about the possibilities of uh, exploring the, the, the universe and end up mostly working in military technologies mm -hmm. because this is how the space is explored uh, mm -hmm. today. And uh, he is building this satellite actually as a, uh, that would, wouldn't have any scientific, any commercial, or any uh, research uh, purposes that would actually be launched and then self-ignite in, the sp uh, in the space after a certain time. To question the notion of the, the, the possibility of a research for the research and the question of uh, art for art's sake. Mm. The other work by Trevor Paglen in the exhibition is this work, that is a uh, work by Trevor Paglen and Jacob Applebaum, that is um, called Autonomy Cube, that is actually a reference to the minimalist works from the, the, the height of the conceptual art of the 60s and 70s. This is a work that, is, that contains functioning uh, wireless a, a device, so it looks like a beautiful minimalist sculpture, mm -hmm. but it also provides um, Tor network within the exhibition, which means that the visitor of exhibition are able to send and receive encrypted information without being monitored. So it's an advocacy tool uh, advocating for the, the, the free internet. It's a tool that is actually turning a museum, one of the most important um, art institutions in Europe, into a node of this store network, because this is you need to have, have like number of those nodes for the this encrypted network that mm -hmm. is providing you an anonymity to function. It is also turning it in the whole network into a, an art piece, because there are quite a serious um, questions about actually making it illegal for you to encrypt anything. Mm -hmm. Everything has to be out in the open. So, but, so the moment this becomes an art piece uh, that stands in the same museum as Guernica, it is actually harder to make it illegal. Mm. So th this is obviously the work that is dealing with questions of use of art in a very direct uh, and very uh, even pragmatic to a mm. certain extent mm. way. And yet, uh, making it, uh, uh, making references to the aesthetic project. So this tension between the the the, the use of art and uselessness of art was also very very yeah. much explored in the in the exhibition. But, but also education and, and issues of Ish of learning of, issues of, of learning and how knowledge. do you learn and yes. how do you learn collectively how mm. do you learn from each other how the knowledge is instrumentalized there there were many works dealing with the question of colonialism yeah. and how the the, the knowledge is subverted through the colonial and post-colonial project or how the post-colonial project is subverted mm. through the different uh, views of knowledge and through different educational projects. Yeah. So I was kind of comparing the two Kurtola texts and um, I mean they do talk about, they both talk about art and the relationship with, between art and politics but I think, um, but I also noticed there was kind of a stark contrast and one is like the Istanbul Bayern is a call for action and uh, you're calling on I, people to, to kind mm. of be activated as viewers and then here you I find that there's a, a change maybe in the kind of way that you're presenting what art can do um, or more you're just presenting the, it as a survey more than the kind of... Yes, but you, I wouldn't really call it a survey because no. if you would call it a survey, I mean, this is also one thing... But it's a, not survey, a, a survey of, of possibilities. 
Well, yeah. okay, maybe, but yeah. maybe let's say, yes, we are trying to, but this is also, I think, important that we are trying to, to, to present works that are opening up new possibilities. So it's, I wouldn't necessarily, maybe, maybe um, in the text, and you're right, maybe as a kind of, um, yeah, actually, there is maybe m more doubt in what an exhibition as a site can do. But still, I think this exhibition, there's more doubt visible than in Istanbul, for sure. But I think this is, again, trying to talk about the, the, the museum and the space of culture as a very, uh, as a space that can be activated all the time mm -hmm. and that should be activated and that uh, should be taken as a possibility mm -hmm. of creating public discourse and new ways of uh, thinking about yeah. our situation. Yeah. There's a really nice uh, or a quote that I really like that you have um, in the, in in the in the um, text, mm -hmm. and also I think I can't remember who it is, but one of your colleagues talk about mm -hmm. it in a mm -hmm. video um, on the Rainosphere website, and it says um, it is not the works that come into contact. I mean, in the exhibition, it is not the works that come into contact, but people who, however, come into contact through the medium of works. And this, mm -hmm. is a, this is a quote from uh, Bakhtin and um, Mendeve, mm -hmm. uh, the formal method of literary scholarship. So uh, um, I wonder if you could talk a bit about that view of, it, of what I exhibitions think, uh, do. I, that for sure, I think exhibitions are uh, exhibitions and the museum uh, of public institutions are the, one of the few public resources that are still uh, here. They are heavily contested, and in a way, we felt that this need to kind of reaffirm it through the, the exhibition, the, the museum as a space of production of public knowledge, of collective knowledge. Mm -hmm. And in this respect, I think it's not, um, uh, you mentioned that there is a several of the, 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 the artists that were taking part in uh, Istanbul. What is also, I think, um, uh, one of the things that uh, our work is characterized by is that we often work with many collectives. And mm. it's not by accident that in this exhibition there is also quite a few of collective uh, um, positions that, uh, of people uh, do doing things together mm. and learning together. One of the really important projects in the exhibition was a um, project by Subtramas, which is a collective from... Um, uh, Spain, from three different cities, that actually devised um, four parts through the exhibition that were happening on a um, weekly basis in the exhibition and that uh, organized different kinds of assemblies, meetings, readings, different events within the exhibition during its duration, and that actually moved um, a bit border of the museum because they move did. The I mean, move the move the, the what they do a bit because uh, it is not so usual for the museum to do public programs within the exhibition. Public mm -hmm. programs are done in the public program okay. space. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, in this way, also uh, Subtramas try to reactivate the space of the exhibition and to see and work with the guards and the different people working in the museum on trying to actually. Uh, activated the exhibition during its duration in a way that was not uh, done mm. before. Okay. Well, I think on that note, we should uh, open open it up to questions, if if there are any. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if there's a microphone. Yeah. So. Um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> uh, uh, I, just want, excuse me. I just wanted to pick up on on the kind of the Brechtian moment and. And the way that Brecht kind of is, 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 is ubiquitous throughout the 11th. Can you hear me? A bit l louder, okay. please. I'll, OK. Um, I just wanted to pick up on that Brechtian moment. That, and Brecht is kind of ubiquitous throughout the 2009 um, Istanbul Biennial. And in, in a way, you know, that what you were saying about 
they have a kind of coming back to the same things and, and kind of having some sort of repetition in the way that the curate exhibitions or you curate exhibitions that's a very brechtian thing isn't it that's a very that's what he does he, he rewrites plays he he, he visits he visits narratives in different formats and that's great but i just want to ask ask you i wondered how we could think about that in kind of the context of right now um because I totally buy those Brechtian arguments in defence of Istanbul 2009, and, and I think that like kind of taking hold of the institutional structure and trying to transform it and, and, and mobilise kind of a socialist model, because let's not forget socialism is built for institutions. The other major position that exists after 2009, and especially after 2010 and 11, and especially 13 with regards to Istanbul, is 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 occupy, isn't it? And 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 the, and the tendency for activists to really try and take over public space, or let's say retake the uncertainty of the public sphere. Now, arguably, activism's new visual culture in that perspective has rendered artistic practice totally unrecognisable to the institution. Yeah. So we've got this idea that. You know, Brett will be advocating a retaking of the institution, but we've got to remember that that's coming to be almost a hundred years old now. Has the, has has this moment after Occupy? Has 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 the alternative method of creativity, collectivity, outside the institution shown the institution to be reached to some sort of end? Is 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 the curatorial now synonymous with? conservation, classification, and canonization that really don't do anything to uh, introduce socialism or a radical form of socialism into this moment of crisis within globalization and the neoliberal economy? I think um, uh, no and yes. It really depends on uh, where and what is happening uh, in each particular location, different city. I think you can do, through the institutions, in various places, quite meaningful things. For example, I, I think Reina Sofia is doing it. Um, I don't know about Istanbul. It's, um, I have my doubts, but it wouldn't be nice of me to say, after me, the flood, we have this saying in, you know, in Croatian. Um, I, Obviously, if, if I were to take Istanbul Biennial now, it would be a completely different exhibition. I'm not sure it would be Brecht. Um, I don't know what it would be. For us, it took, um, as I said, almost a year of talking to people with friends, journalists, cultural producers, artists, to come with the concept. What is good about Istanbul, I was talking about not having resources, but one resource that they give you, at least they did at the time, was time. You had two full, we had two full years, which is a lot, quite a lot. So, I mean, it took us a year to figure out what we want to do, and then another year and announce it, and then another year to, to actually make it. I really can't tell you now, what would I do if I were to? I have to say, I didn't, unfortunately, see the, the, the last one. I, one of my colleagues went. I couldn't. Uh, done by Fulia Erdemci, which was happening at the height of the, the protest and Gezi Park and everything. And I have to say, I was not envying her. And I thought, this woman has a really, really tough uh, job. Whatever, and again, I think what truth is, whatever she tries to do, it can be, given the fact who is funding the, this um, event, how is it framed, it can easily be dismissed, dismissed out of hand. But I don't advocate. I think this is easy, easy to do. I mean, she didn't do herself any favors by having activists yeah. thrown out of public conversations yeah. in the months leading up to the biennial, but that's, that's a different story. I wonder if you could make a, sorry to, I'll mm -hmm. pass the microphone after this. I wonder if you could make a, a to some degree, a, maybe a diluted socialist intervention and tell us how, what, what proportion of the biennial's funding Koch do provide? No, <laughs> I mean, I don't even remember it, so I wouldn't want to. Can you it. estimate? I mean, 
Uh, it was not not big, frankly. In Less the, than ten percent. I don't know. No, I don't know. I really Less don't. Than I, I truly, I truly don't know. Okay. I would have to go back to check it, but I remember when I, when it was that I felt like uh, for the trouble biennial. But frankly, I have to say, I, I mean the whole. Istanbul uh, Foundation for the Arts um, is funded by a Zajibashi family, which is another super rich pharmaceutical family. And yeah, I mean, the whole uh, framework of the, the, the contemporary art in Turkey is done in a completely different way than we that are coming from Western Europe with the tradition of public funding of the arts see. This does not exist in Turkey at all. There is no public, there is zero public funding for the contemporary arts, for any arts beyond the antiquities and heritage for that matter. So the question is, do you want to engage in this type of format and do some kind of things? Or you decide Turkey is not a place where you can do contemporary art? I I mean, I don't have a right answer. I think it's a question of open for discussion. Mm. I have a question and then a comment, if possible. Mm -hmm. um, you being, I mean, a curator that's been working in different places now, Renia Sofia and Istanbul, would you consider working within another difficult context like Istanbul, where contemporary art is not that accepted, and the VS, how would you go about it? Yes, I mean, in each place, it really depends. I mean, we, were, we did an exhibition in uh, Moscow like half a year, year ago. It was already, the, the, the conflict between Ukraine and uh, Russia has already started. I mean, how we did it, we did it in a way that we worked with Stodelat and we said, okay, you tell us, should we do it or should we say no? How should we do it? We organized meetings of Ukrainian and Russian artists as a part of the of the event and try to discuss in which way you can use art to deal with the, the what boycott is should there be boycott or not so i mean istanbul and is not the, the only difficult no, place, place, fact, place the where, the where we worked before so i would say for each place you you try to think what are the pros what are the cons you try to talk with people who are your friends. You ask them advice, friends, people who you trust, whose intellectual rigor and what they, what they do you believe. And then you make a decision of whether you want to work there or not. I'm asking since you mentioned ge geographies, the different mm -hmm, geographies mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. art is going and mm -hmm, contemporary mm -hmm. art in certain areas, especially mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean, are not as much. Mm -hmm. well kind of accepted by the general public by the community of the local community mm -hmm. and there's this this thing that's mm -hmm. that was mm -hmm. that's that's why mm -hmm. there was that question thank you. thank you there's one at the very back uh, i'd like to thank you for your uh, interesting talk um I just want to say that uh, I've, I've, I've read my wrote my dissertation on on um, institutional critique and uh, Hito Steil, and uh, she participated in the 2013, the 13th Biennale in Istanbul, and I think kind of uh, it was quite successful in the in that respect that uh, the institutional critique quite worked quite well from inside the institution as a self critique. Uh, so uh, I think it kind of moved quite well from kind of being from the outside, you know, as an outside critique to an inside, and it functioned quite well in the middle of the, the you know, street riots and things like that. You know, the, the fact that she managed to kind of criticize uh, the the, the um, companies that sponsor uh, the Biennale uh, directly through her work, through her video. Um, uh, would you think uh, 
which that um, this is moving towards uh, the Istanbul Biennale being more and more active uh, as kind of institutional critique from uh, from inside of it. No, no. no I think uh, Hito is a good artist. She, I mean, they are open to a certain extent. And I think uh, people who are doing it are not so stupid. They know that they can't really censor the artist uh, easily. And I think it's OK that she, she can do it and she can talk about it mm. and do an analysis of it. But um, I'm not sure how long term this is. I think these things are, as I said, a bit like a rubber band going, you know, you mm. stretch them and then they go back. But that doesn't mean that we have to try stretching. <laughs> <laughs> again and again. Yes. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yvette and Lena. I, I wanted to ask you about didacticism. You mentioned that the Istanbul Biennial Fee was a didactic show. And and I also wanted to ask about doubt, because you said there was more doubt in the René Sophia show. So I wanted to ask whether they were um, complementary pairs in some way. But also, I'm very clear from your description of the Istanbul Biennial what your sort of curatorial project was, what you might mm -hmm. be seeking mm -hmm. to um, express as curators or convey or uh, argue. But I'm wondering how the didacticism expressed itself in the exhibition space in particular, and how doubt in René Sophia was manifest in the exhibition space. And I think in René Sophia, there was, uh, you, doubt was not manifest in the exhibition space that much, no? Uh, maybe in the text, more. Mm. Mm, in terms of the didacticism in, um, in the Istanbul, there were the um, classrooms, as we call them, in um, oh, in Tutun de Pozu, there was this. Um, no, we have to. Yeah. There was this space. It's long. It's okay. So this is the school. Uh, no, there were there were in the school. And I don't know why this is happening. Oh, well, what? No, okay, it now it is, okay. So there was a space in the tobacco factory at the top floor, which had uh, all the statistics uh, shown, which also had um, questionnaires that were taken from Brecht, from um, his uh, play measure. And they're actually yeah, here. Just... Thanks. Um, that are actually asking the uh, audience for reflection. So in a way, it was a direct invitation for the, um, and for the audience to reflect on what they are seeing. There was um, a classroom in the um, Greek school, one that was empty, and that had statistics on the Greek population of Istanbul, which made it pretty clear why the school can be used as a venue, because there is no pupils. And uh, so there were certain moves like that that were pretty, how would I say, direct. And why is it, you, you, you said this already, but I want to ask you again, why is it didactic and not transparent? You said it wasn't about transparency. No, I w uh, the transparency was, I think, it was pretty openly showing and saying, see, this is what I want you to think or see. Unlike just putting things in the open and then leaving. I mean, it was giving a bit of, a, of an answer, you could say. It was very openly saying, this is what I want, want this is what I want to say. It was, when I said it wasn't about transparency, that, that was mostly meant to say about the budget and this question, how much was who giving? I mean, and what I wanted to say, it wasn't, I mean, transparency, always when you show statistics, I mean, statistics are not transparent, you know, which people usually interpreted it as very transparent, while actually we think it was not. It, yeah.
Yeah, I, I was actually going to ask you about these questions as well. Yes, so I didn't what did we do it. with it? We didn't yeah. do, we, we, we went through it, we read it, but yeah. we didn't like do anything. Uh, yeah, my it. question was because there's like, for yeah. example, four questions. Do you think an event like this is politically instructive for the audience? So the audience have to think, was I, you know, instructive? Do you think it is politically instructive for the performers? Do you, to which lessons embody, uh, to which lessons embodied in the exhibition do you object politically and so on? And so I asked, what did you do? Yeah, nothing. At one point we thought we would do something and maybe publish them or do what we didn't. We just have scans of it. There's one more question. Yeah. Okay. I just want to say that I was in Istanbul for the Biennale and it was wonderful to see your pictures because it reminded me of what a very splendid event it was. However, there was something going on at the same time there was a major book fair. And I went to the book fair, invited to talk about a couple of my books that had been translated into Turkish. And I was very struck talking to the publisher, a wonderful sort of left-wing intellectual, though I have to say I think she was pretty much of a Stalinist publishing house. And I said, but I'm really keen to go and look at the Biennale. And she looked very, very disapproving, saying, why would you want to do that? And as a result of her being my chaperone, she had, I had to drag her around the Biennale, and, you know, a, a, a Turkish intellectual. And I have to say that the, the actual impact of walking around it, by the second day, she had begun to sort of see there might be something quite interesting. But, I was wondering, wh were you prepared for the, to be such a sort of sour reception from uh, sort of leftist intellectuals? And w do you get that sort of reception in, in, in Zagreb or? No. No. Um, <laughs> no, we, I mean, a really good friend of ours uh, who was the first person that we met when we got a uh, curator, the, when we got to Istanbul and we went for a drink with him. He looked at us and he said, you really took it? Why? <laughs> so, I mean, there were indications of sour reception, I have to say, yeah. some. But um, no, I have to say to this extent, we didn't. And um, it wasn't only the, the, the sour reception. Quite a few people, I mean, uh, people around Tutun de Pozu, so Anadolu Kultur Center, different people were very, very receptive and helpful and generous. So for us, it was also a pleasant experience, but the, the extent of the, when it happened right before the opening, how angry it will make people, no, we didn't expect it. Mm. I mean, not that much. Um, maybe so just one very brief yeah. last question. Is there any other question? So maybe I'll ask any a, a brief question. question. Okay. Um, I'm interested in this concept of collectivity that you've been exploring over the mm -hmm. years in, in different ways. And I wonder how that plays out within your own working process uh, in terms of the conceptualization of the shows and working with such a number, mm. uh, incredible number of artists. And how do you, within yourselves as a collective, negotiate those conversations and those um, boundaries? And mm. uh, we were all having this discussion before. I think uh, we met um, at the time which was kind of opening. I mean, we met or started working together, which was opening after a pretty harsh time. And when there was a sense of possibility that things are changing, that they are going for the better. But it was still, I mean, the, 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 the memories of the, the, the really, really harsh nationalistic xenophobic uh, war, horrible 90s was pretty strong and present for us. And we found each other based on that. First of all, that we politically are allies and that we felt in our late 20s, early 30s that we can do something in culture and create a space where we can put together politics and art together. And to this day, we don't have big con fights or disagreements about these most important things. And this is like the political direction. And we obviously have the similar taste, if taste is the same word, because we 
don't have fights or arguments about that. We sit and talk quite a lot. For us, the bigger problem is um, generating many programs because we have created kind of a semi institution from which four of us live. And, but for, to do that, we have to apply for funds, we have to look for funding, we have to like produce nonstop. And this is what creates a bit of a, you know, like this nonstop production, especially, you know, and we are on Skype like three, four times a week for a couple of hours now since Natasha is living in Berlin. So we just talk and discuss what are the next projects, what are the invitations that are we getting, how do we pay utilities, millions of things. I mean, it's all, you know, lumped together. And then we have, yeah, like, OK, today we talk just about the concept. We have to figure out that next exhibition and who are the artists. Most of the th these things we do by consensus, by talking. It takes time. It takes uh, energy. And then we divide the tasks like you would in any other collaboration. I mean, if we had, for example, in Istanbul, we had 60 artists. Each of us had 15 to kind of follow from the beginning to the end. Except that, of course, all the big decisions, what are we going to show and how it's going to be made, the setup and everything we decided together. We were just sitting on these endless meetings. And, uh, you know. and then practically, we divide it. And we have one email that all four of us read that drives people crazy. <laughs> but uh, it's one email address to this day, like 15 years later. And everything that gets answered by any of us automatically goes to BCC, so that all three others immediately see that it was answered. And it works. <laughs> OK. Yeah. All right. Uh, yeah. I think if there is no other question, I'd just like to thank uh, enormously to Yvette and to Lean for this brilliant conversation today and to invite all of you to come back to Huan Ru in May if you're inter interested in Cities on the Move, which is the exhibition he will be discussing. Thank you. Thank you.